praise God for that. The, um, between the, the worship and that, I'm glad I wanted to start out with a joke today. That's fantastic. <laughs> that's okay, because it's not a very good joke. So it's actually an old joke, so um, you've probably heard it before, but it kind of fits with uh, the plan for today. Um, there was a guy on the roof of his house, and uh, it's flooding, so he's up on the roof trying to avoid the flood. And the water's up to the roof line, and a boat comes by, and, and they say, hey, get in the boat, we'll get you out of here. And he goes, no, no, I'm waiting on a miracle from God. The water keeps rising up, it's getting up to about, you know, just below the waist, and another boat comes by, like, hey, get in the boat, get in the boat. He's like, no, no, I'm good, I'm praying, I'm waiting on a miracle from God. Water's getting up, about the chest, and the third boat comes by, it says, get in the boat, we'll get you out of here. He goes, no, no, I'm waiting on a miracle from God. Water's up to his chin, helicopter flies over, drops a ladder down. He says, grab the ladder, we'll get you out of here. He goes, no, no, I'm waiting on a miracle from God. He obviously doesn't make it. He's standing up at the pearly gates, complaining. And uh, you know, why didn't God send a miracle and save me? And Peter, St. Peter said, I don't know what you're talking about. We sent three boats and a helicopter. <laughs> so, uh, it's, you know, it's old. But anyway, the, uh, yeah. I didn't want to start with a joke after I watched all that, but I had it, so I went with it. Um, we're talking about the lost miracles of Peter today. Um, I'll explain what that means in just a second, but I kind of wanted to start out with what uh, the definition of a miracle is according to the dictionary, and a uh, little difference that I have for that opinion, but the Random House College Dictionary says a miracle is an event in the physical world that surpasses all known human or natural powers and is ascribed to a divine or su supernatural cause. In other words, God did it. But, you know, God can send a boat and a helicopter just as easy as he can do some miraculous healing. And, and I think uh, the reason I titled this The Lost Miracles of Peter is because there's some miracles in the Bible, I think, that get overlooked because they're overshadowed by big miracles, what I call the big miracles that everybody likes to talk about. But there's other things that can be equally as important and important to our lives if we don't miss them. And so... Uh, I really kind of got inspired by this when I was in Israel this summer. Uh, those of you know that I went, uh, it was a very emotional experience, uh, amazing experience. If you ever get a chance to go to Israel, go to Israel. And I, I can't stress enough how amazing it is to stand in some of the places where these stories took place, where Jesus was standing, where the disciples were standing, and then read the Bible the same way. You can't do it. And uh, So I was kind of inspired by that, and I uh, shared uh, with Sean what I wanted to uh, share today he was like absolutely uh, we'll get you a date and it was today so here i am uh, so the first thing i want to share is in matthew chapter 14 uh, which i'll turn to in just a second but i want to explain one thing about the sea of galilee first while you're turning to matthew chapter 14 in your bibles uh, this is a picture of the plains of the golan heights and then the sea of galilee from up on top of the golan heights uh, it's huge flat farmland uh, once you get up to the top and basically wind back and forth to get up to the top of this mountain, it's called the Heights because it's really high. Uh, the mountain range in the distance on that top picture is Jordan. Uh, a little to the left of that, you can see mountains over in Syria. Uh, but it's this huge, huge, huge flat land. And then uh, it's kind of hard to tell in this picture, but right, whoops, that's not the button, that's good. <laughs> right about here, this dark line is actually a cliff where it drops down straight down to. The, that farmland that you can kind of see that goes to the Sea of Galilee there. Um, the sea of Galilee, of course, a little misleading. It's really more like a big lake. Uh, it's about, uh, it's probably a little bit smaller actually than Lake Eustace. So it's not that big. It's 14 miles by seven miles. So it's not really that big a lake. But uh, the reason I wanted to point this out is in chapter 14 and this and other stories, I've always read about the storms coming up and out of nowhere and, and kind of catching the fishermen and stuff. And I'm, I'm like, these guys are professional fishermen. How do you not know when there's a storm coming? I can step outside my door in the afternoon and see the clouds and know there's a storm coming. But the, the geography is why. When you get up to the top of this mountain, you have that huge flat plain up there. And if you've ever been to North Lake Park, it's the best example I can give that's local, but it's a big, open, flat area. You could pretty much fly a kite there almost any day you want to. It's always kind of breezy there. Well, this wind comes across the plains and then drops down on this cliff and just races across the sea. So the storms can come up very fast and in a hurry, and you can't see anything because from the sea, you can't see across the top. So even if there were storm clouds, you can't see them. And just regular wind, obviously, we can't see, and it comes racing down that cliff line and can cause a storm. Uh, 
uh, in a hurry. So they can come up and you can get caught actually uh, fairly easily. So Matthew 14 kind of talks about that a little bit at the beginning, uh, verse 23 to 33. And I'm reading out of the New American Standard Bible. Scott assures me it's the most accurate version. <laughs> And after he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was, when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already many uh, stadia, just distance away from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking in the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were frightened, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage in his eye, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, <clears throat> he became afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? When they got to the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. So, obvious miracles. Uh, that have been spoken about lots of times. Of course, Jesus walking on the water, Peter walking on the water, and uh, there's lots of good messages that can be uh, spoken about, preached on about all that, but that's not why I'm here today. I'm here to talk about the lost one there that uh, a lot of people miss, um, and that's right in the verse 32. They climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And it's not the wind dying down, it's the fact that they got back to the boat. Peter didn't just walk on water out to Jesus. Fear and doubt set in. Jesus saved him, and they walked back to the boat. Peter walked on water twice. So, uh, a lot of times that gets looked over, um, but that is a, a big deal because it's one of those things that you can look over, and it's it, it's important. Uh, kind of like uh, Jerry was talking about today, that God is there for you to support you and give you strength. That's when it was. He was, he, was, he was afraid, he was doubting, and Jesus took his hand and walked him back to where he was safe. Amen. So this is my first miracle here. It's the miracle of support. We're afraid, we're full of doubt, and God is there to support you. Uh, for instance, last week, Corinne gave her testimony. The miracle of Jason loving her through that. That's a miracle that can be overlooked by... You know, all the other things that she talked about, and she did talk about Jason, but that, that's a miracle, too, that he loved her through that. Amen. So you don't want to miss that. There's, you know, Numbers, uh, in the book of Numbers, in chapter 14, at the beginning, the um, Jews are complaining, which they did a lot when they were in the Exodus part, uh, about, you know, if only we died in Egypt, if only we died out here in the wilderness instead of by the sword. <coughs> they're afraid and they're full of doubt. So God showed himself there in a big way um, in verse 10. The glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the sons of Israel. So he actually showed himself there. But I'm sure that Jason was afraid of what was going on. I'm sure that, obviously, the Jews were afraid of what was going on. Peter was afraid of what was going on. The sea was rough, and it's fear and doubt set in. And God was there to support him and take him back to safety. And that wasn't the only time Peter was afraid. And Peter was afraid again. Uh, in the book of John. Uh, so if you want to flip to John 21, I'm going to talk about a uh, bigger section, but first I want to talk about verse 3. Uh, this is after Jesus has been crucified. It's right at the end. It's the last book of John. And, um, you know, Peter has denied Jesus three times. The resurrection's happened, but, you know, his world has basically fallen apart at this point. Everything he's been doing, everything he's done for the last three years, it's all just sort of come crashing down around him. And so he says, I'm going fishing. But it's not like if I called Brandon and said, hey, let's go fishing. And it wasn't that kind of fishing. And the Greek, the word is pago, pago, I don't really know how to say it, but that's how you spell it. And it means to go out, or go away, or go back. But he wasn't saying, I'm going to go fishing, like I'm just going to go fishing for the day. He was going back to fishing. He, he was done with ministry. He, he was going back to what he knew because everything had ended. And 
so I just wanted to kind of set the stage of what was going on there and what his mindset was when uh, this happened. Um, that's basically where this story takes place. I was standing um, on the rocks there where Jesus called Peter. So that's right on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, I'm going to read from uh, chapter 21, 1 through 12. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way, uh, basically straight across from where I'm standing in that picture. It was a city. It's Tiberias. It's on the sea. It's kind of the way the Romans referred to it instead of the Sea of Galilee. They called it the Sea of Tiber Tiberias because that was the city that was there on the water, the big city. Uh, let's see, verse 2. They, there were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we will also come with you. Kind of set up what's going on there. They're, they're done. They don't really know what to do. They're kind of lost. They went out, got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus therefore said to them, children, you do not have any fish, do you? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find a catch. They cast therefore, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. That disciple therefore, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. And so when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, about 100 yards, dragging the net full of fish. And so when they got out upon the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid, and fish placed on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of large fish, 153, and although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Obviously, we have the miracle of Jesus being resurrected. We have the miracle of him telling them to cast the net out into the sea and catching that huge lot of fish. There's another miracle in there that uh, is very important. It's in verse 11. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of large fish, 153. I'm very specific about that. But look back at the story. If you look at who was in the boat, you had Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee, though that's sons plural, so we'll say two. Two other of his disciples, seven. There's seven people in that boat. Then you go to verse six. They cast, they were not able to haul it in. Seven guys could not pull that net into the boat. Simon pulled it onto the land by himself. That's a miracle. A net with 103 fish in it that seven guys couldn't pick up, and Peter picked it up and dragged it onto the ground by himself. Okay, God gives the miracle of strength in times of weakness and need. Peter was weak. He was definitely in need. He denied Jesus three times and was going back to fishing. He was done. He didn't know what to do. His life had basically crashed down around him. And this, right after this in the story, is where Jesus said, you know, do you love me three times to restore him? But that, that's, where, that's where he was. He was in that time of need. There, there's all kinds of place, places in the Bible where God gives us strength when we have that need. Psalm 46.1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Isaiah 40, 29 and 31, he gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Say he increased Peter's power. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. 2 Corinthians 12, 9-10. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. 
Therefore I am content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am forty days, and then again on the cross, Amen. your strength is not going to impress him. Don't rely on it. Trials and times of needs are so that we keep him first. That's when you need to look to him even more. Peter was going to do wrong. He was going to make a bad choice relying on his own strength. So Jesus appeared there on the shoreline to bring him back on what I find ironic. That shoreline is all rocks, and they ate.